Hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, Geology of National Park series. This one specifically on Yosemite. Um, me and Sarah are here joining you today, and I just want to thank you for taking the time to be here and for watching this video. Um, you can see on the main screen that we have a question for you. So please, if you're joining us today, make sure to drop where you're from. And also if you've ever visited Yosemite National Park before. So we're going to get started um, just to be able to make sure that we're on time and that we can fit everything into this time. And so my name is Maddie Honia. I'm a program manager at Girl Scouts of Silver Sage. Our council is located in Boise, Idaho. My background in geology, um, I went to school for geoscience and I taught high school geoscience for a couple of years. I also volunteered at the Idaho Museum of Mining and Geology for a couple of years. And I'm joined here with Sarah Tetzloff. Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, I am Sarah Tetzloff. I am the program coordinator for Girl Scouts of Silver Sage. Uh, my geology background has a degree in geology from Idaho State University in Pocatello, Idaho. I taught earth sciences for a year in Idaho Falls, Idaho, and I have done research um, in several different places around the country. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. So as we get started, feel free to comment um, just wherever you're viewing this if you have any questions and we will try our best to answer them. We'll also save some time at the end to answer questions, but I know it can be kind of hard to forget as we go along. So if you've joined us the past couple of weeks, you know that we've talked about earthquakes and we started with Yellowstone National Park. Yellowstone was the first national park created and coincidentally, Yosemite is the second national park created. So Sarah and I did not intend to do that, but look at that, we have an order now. Yosemite was first made a national park in October of 1890. Um, a big part of what made this park happen was that John Muir, a conservationist who lived in the park, um, really advocated for the park and also gave tours to uh, Pre President Teddy Roosevelt to really say like, this is a, a place that needs to be protected, a place that needs to be um, kept sacred. So I'm gonna pass it over to Sarah. All right, so since Idaho um, is not very close to Yellow or to Yosemite, we decided to do a little bit of tour before we start talking about everything, kind of like we did with Yellowstone last week. So Yosemite National Park is in California. It is just north of Death Valley and Sequoia National Park, and it is south of Sacramento and, and just east of San Francisco. So if you've ever been in that area, you weren't very far from Yosemite. So Yosemite has some really cool places to visit. So this is the park map itself. This is from the National Park Service with all of their uh, camp spots and hiking spots marked. The first place I wanted to show you is called Merced Lake. Uh, this is the first High Sierra camp in Yosemite. So that means it's a camp that you have to hike to to get there. You can't drive up there. Uh, it's only staffed in the summer, and they have a bunch of different yurts and camp spots there that you can hang out in for a couple of days. The And this is a 14-mile hike, by the way. So this isn't just a mile. This is, this is a long ways. The second one is... Um, Tulumun Meadows. I think I said that right. I don't ever get it right. I think it's Tulum. <laughs> Tulum. Uh, well, this one is uh, one of the largest high elevation lakes in that mountain range. It's at 8,600 feet above sea level. So that's even higher than Idaho is where we are now in Boise. The third one is called Mariposa Grove. This is a grove of sequoia trees, which are some of the biggest trees in the world. This, uh, this grove has over 500 trees in it, and they're special because they can get up to 35 feet wide and almost 300 feet tall. So they're giant trees, and they only grow in certain elevations. And that means that they, they only grow really in this park and just south of this park. So they're very rare to see in the world. The last part of Yosemite National Park is called Yosemite Valley. So this is where probably 90% of the people that visit Yosemite Park go because it's so condensed and it's so pretty. So we're gonna jump right into Yosemite Valley real quick and show you some of the things in there. 
So this here is the map of just Yosemite Valley. There's one road that goes in and one road that goes out. The first place is called Half Dome. So this is probably one of the most famous places in the country, if not the world, when people think of Yosemite. This is a 4,000 foot tall uh, piece of granite, which we're gonna talk about later and teach you more about. You can hike it, but you have to have a permit to do it. So you have to apply to be able to go up. Uh, you can't just go if you want to. And they have, what well, you can see, they kind of have some lines and stuff that help you up. It's a pretty steep hike. The second place is called El Capitan. So this is one of the largest pieces of unbroken granite in the United States. It's 3,000 feet tall, and it's probably one of the coolest places to climb. So this is actually where modern day rock climbing was created. They actually have a plaque at the bottom of El Capitan that says that. The third place is called Glacier Point. So this is somewhere where you can walk, uh, drive up to or walk up to, and it's an overlook that shows the whole valley. So you can see Half Dome on the right there, and El Capitan is kind of off the side, off the picture. The third place, or the fourth place, is called Yosemite Falls. This is actually one of the world's highest waterfalls, and it's broken up into three different ones. It's over 2,000 feet high, which is pretty crazy. Then we have Mirror Lake. Um, this is a two mile hike and it's the best place to see Half Dome and it's paved and it's super nice. And it's also one of the only places in Yosemite where you can swim. The last one is called Horsetail Falls. Now this one, you're probably thinking, Sarah, you can't really see a falls. It's not that cool. But what's really cool about this is it flows over El Capitan. And if you're there in like late February and you get the timing just right with the sunset, you can actually see something called a firefall. So this is what they call the Yosemite firefall. And it only happens in early, early May or no, late February, early March. Um, and only happens during sunset. So now I'm going to pass it on over to Maddie and we're going to be talking about all the geology of it. When I was visiting Yosemite last, I learned something really cool about Firefall in that when people used to actually live in the valley, um, I don't remember if it was annually or when they do it, but they would light a giant bonfire at the top of that waterfall and then throw it off. And that was the, like the Firefall that actually fell from it. And that was something I read when I was visited the, Yosemite. That was from the hotel, actually. Um, the hotel oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, poured their embers over the side of it. I think that would have been so fascinating to see. So um, the reason that we wanted to tell you a little bit about the features that you see in Yosemite is because it'll make sense as we go into how it was formed and the rocks that are there and the different processes that have affected Yosemite. So there's kind of three different stages that we're going to talk about. Um, the first is the actual like, creation of that. Um, we're, we're calling it a batholith. It sounds like basilisk, but with THs, so bath o -lith. It's a really fun word. Um, so we're gonna talk about that and how it created the rocks in Yosemite. We'll also talk about some of the rocks that were deposited on top and then how it was eroded over time to give us this amazing, amazing landscape that we have today. So, um, if you joined us for some of our last ones, um, some of our last, webinars lives we talked a lot about volcanism and some of the features with volcanoes so what i have here is a, a cross section of what could could be under a volcano and what i really want you to look at is the section called magma chamber so we think about these being underneath the earth full of magma it's molten Sometimes those cool down. Um, it's maybe the heat source from it leaves, some things change, but that magma chamber might actually cool down into hard rock. Um, and when something like that has a lot of time to cool, you often get really pretty crystals, really large crystals in it, and that's where we get that granite. So what happened was that the magma chamber actually cooled underneath Yosemite before it was eroded and before um, it was uplift uplifted for us to see. So the original rock that we see now, the rock that we see when we go, is all granite. Sarah, will you go to the next slide? 
All right. So here's an example of what would have uplifted um, some of that rock of, of that bath lift that we're talking about. Along these boundaries, we see a lot of different types of tension and pressure. So as things are moving across by each other, like a transform, if they're hitting each other, like a con convergent boundary, or if they're going apart, like a divergent boundary, that's going to affect the landscape around it differently. So all of this was happening around where Yosemite was when it was being created. And that's why all of this huge batholith that was deep, deep underground was lifted up. So in this picture, you can see um, where you can imagine, sorry, where Yosemite would have been. This is during the late Cretaceous period. So Yosemite would have been, if you can see where the North American continent is, it would have been underwater. It would have been in a really shallow ocean. And what that means is a lot of um, sea creatures and sand and um, dead sea animals would have kind of been in that area and would have been compacted into rock over time. Then as that rock started to move, as the plates were moving around, it would have heated up really hot until it metamorphosed into something like marble. So that's a metamorphized rock that goes from limestone to marble. So that's why we have really pretty, really um, like shocking looking rocks when you go into Yosemite. You can see kind of how this moves over time to where we are today. Here's another example. If you remember us talking about plate tectonics, um, the Juan de Fuca plate actually is going under, it's subducting underneath the North American plate. This has been happening for a long, 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 long time. And so this movement would have affected Yosemite. And you can even see how in this um, GIF, it starts to expand out and you can see California kind of being stretched. All right, so that's a little bit of background as to the rock that's underneath Yosemite, what we see. But the actual geologic origin of Yosemite had, has been under debate for a long time. Um, we have an answer now, or we think we do, but for the longest time, um, especially because geoscience is a very new science, people did not quite understand what would have formed this really unique valley. So at the time, um, there was a man named Josiah Whitney. He was the lead geologist for California. And his theory was that when an earthquake happens, the valley might drop. So if you have a valley, it might drop during the earthquake and make those really sheer walls that we see in Yosemite. Another theory was that when a river goes through rock or goes through any type of material, it starts to carve a valley. So maybe the river that goes through Yosemite carved the valley. And lastly, this was not um, a hypothesis at the time, but the one that they came up with was glaciers. So potentially glaciers carved this valley. So if you see A, B, and C, these are different types of valleys. The first one, A, is a valley where an earthquake would have happened and the valley dropped. We call this a graben, which, Sarah, is that not German for grave graben? It is. Yeah. <laughs> and then B is that river valley. And C, that big U-shaped one, is the glacial valley. So from what you've heard and what you've seen, I'd love for you to drop in the comments, which do you think Yosemite is? Do you think it's caused by earthquakes, which is A, a river, which is B, or glaciers, which is C? You just throw that in the comments. And what's really important to remember is think about what the sides of these valleys look like. The one with the river has very steep sides uniformly. The one with the glacier, they're pretty sloped. Uh, they're 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 gentle. And the graben, it looks more like a slant than a steep side. Yeah, so it's going to be that that almost like a, I don't know, it's not a W because it doesn't have the inside. But it has that very sloped side, whereas the glacier is more rounded. So if you have any guesses for what you think that Yosemite Valley was caused by, please drop them into the comments. Thank you, Hannah. The first one, A, is caused from an earthquake. 
flat valley steep sides, B from a river steep sides, or C from a glacier but U-shaped valley. So we are going to continue on. I'll tell you what the answer is in a moment here. Um, so at the time, the head geologist believed it was caused by these earthquakes. He was convinced that when these earthquakes happen, the valley floor drops, leaving these sheer sides. But John Muir, who we mentioned earlier, he had been living in the valley for a long time, and he had experienced minor earthquakes before. And from his experience, he did not believe that the earthquakes could actually cause something like that. Um, what he saw is that during earthquakes, there would be like some tumbling of rocks, like some rock fall, things like that, um, but not these sheer sides of, of granite. And so in 18, oh, that's a, that's a, a away. 1872, um, there was actually a huge earthquake that hit Yosemite National Park. And everyone who was living there at the time kind of freaked out because they believed this lead geologist that an earthquake could cause the valley to drop. But John Muir knew otherwise. And so he ended up setting out, um, going on a hike to collect evidence that it was not caused by this earthquake. So he made sure to write down everything that he saw that had changed from the earthquake. And then he also ended up hiking up to the nearest glacier to actually see where was it, what was the path it had been leading. And from his experience, he found that it was glaciers that carved this valley, not earthquakes. So if you guess C, you are correct. Yosemite was carved by glaciers. Um, of course, there is a river that does run through Yosemite, so there still is some, some river erosion, but the general shape of the valley is caused by glaciers. So that being said, we're going to jump into my personal favorite topic, which is glaciers. Um, I wanted to give you a kind of an understanding of what a glacier is, um, because most of you probably haven't seen one before. Um, I've never seen one in real life, but I watch a lot of documentaries about them and they look really cool. Um, and so in the top left corner, you'll see a diagram of a glacier. Um, some important things to notice is that we have this main glacier with like a little one coming off to the side. Um, so we have glaciers that kind of feed into each other. We have this zone that kind of builds up all the snow. And then as that snow turns into ice, it moves down the glacier. If you've watched Frozen 2, you know that a glacier is a river of ice. So this does move. It does move actually pretty fast for a for ice, you know. Um, so glaciers are one of our most powerful tools of erosion because of how big they are and how much mass and force they have. So in Yosemite, about a million years ago, the snow and ice accumulated up high in the mountains, forming these glaciers that moved through the river valleys. So wherever it got cold, it would have filled up. The downslope of all this ice would have cut and sculpted the U-shaped valley that so many people um, love to see today. This uplifting that was happening at the time where the rocks are getting pushed up meant that all those rocks were exposed to the forces. So expo exposed to wind and water and ice, and they started to gradually become um, exfoliated. So you can think of you have dry hands, they started to rub down. Um, and other things started to happen. So big events of mass wasting were occurring. Um, a lot of material was transferring away. And to really understand how much impact glaciers have, um, we're gonna go through a couple different um, topics of them so you can see kind of what is the proof that a glacier has been there before and how can you possibly identify a glacier's been in an area next time you go there. So the first, if you wanna go back for one moment, Sarah, this first one, um, that top right, you can see that this rock is very shiny. It looks like it's been polished. And this is called glacial polishing because the rocks, the glacier actually picks up rocks, as you can see in the bottom right picture, and drags those rocks across the surface of other rocks. And this exfoliates it much like you would like a rock polisher. So you're tumbling it around in like sediment. And so it makes the rocks in this area very smooth and shiny. And if you go to Yosemite, you can see a lot of this glacial polishing. You ready? ready? Yeah. The next one, I think this is Sarah's favorite, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> is ice wedging. So 
when water gets into um, a crack or something and it freezes, the ice expands. And so this means that it might occupy a small space and then as it expands, it starts to break open. So this can happen to rocks like you see in this picture, but it also happens to like our roads during the winter. So it's, it's why we might have a lot of road damage after a really bad winter season. Best way to do this is to fill up a water bottle and put it in the freezer. The ice will expand to the point that it will pop the bottle cap off because there's not enough room in the water bottle. Oh, that's fun. I'll try that one. <clears throat> My mom's telling me Grand Canyon facts from over the computer. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the next one we want to talk about is moraines. These are pretty cool because it's essentially like the the barriers um or if you're going bowling like the little barriers for bowling but for uh, a glacier and so this is all that material the glacier has picked up and scooped to the sides and the end of the glacier um and these will remain long after the glacier has left so you can see some pictures um where one is actually around the glacier and then one where the glacier has receded and it'll leave these really large mounds of dirt um that can eventually you know grow over with vegetation, but for the most part, remain kind of these weird little mountains. Oops. This next one has to do with, in that first picture, how we had a glacier that ran into the other one, like um, streams and a tri like tributaries coming together. When some of these come together, they um, are higher than the other glaciers. So you can imagine a really big glacier, and then there's this little one that connects in. So when the big glacier leaves and the little glacier leaves, we're left with these things called hanging valleys. And so they're these big U's, and you can see um, in all of them they have a waterfall, which is really cool. And almost all the pictures I found were from Yosemite, but these are really characteristic of a smaller glacier that would have been kind of uh, coming into a main glacier. These next ones, um, these are called Paternoster Lakes. Um, and so what's really cool about them is that as a glacier moves, it kind of picks up debris and picks up debris and puts it elsewhere. It'll gouge out these giant holes in the ground that make these little lakes. So these lakes almost mimic the path of the glacier and are usually just left over, you know, the meltwater from that area, but they are often in these chains of lakes. A term that you um, probably heard earlier and will definitely hear a lot in anything geology is called mass wasting. Essentially what this means is that you are taking a lot of stuff and you are moving it far away very quickly. So think of landslides, rock slides, earthquakes, um, anything where soil or rocks are kind of being displaced from where they're supposed to be. So in Yosemite, although the glacier is what kind of carved out the rock, only about 5 to 15% of the actual valley was carved by a glacier, and the rest was from rocks breaking off because the glacier had weakened it so much. So there's enough ice in there, enough stuff going on that it weakened this rock, and they started to break off into these pieces. This next one um, is something that I find is like my road trip, it's something I look for on road trips. Um, it's called talus. And what it is is just the material that accumulates at the bottom of a cliff. So if you're driving, and I, I mean anywhere, and you look, you'll see these kind of pyramid shaped and they just look like piles of dirt. But what it is, is that's the area that dirt is kind of accumulating and falling down the mountain. And so you'll see these honestly everywhere, any type of mountain, any type of hill, there is somewhere that this um, rock is depositing and it usually is in this like pyramid shape. Um, if they get big, we call them alluvial fans. So they'll, they'll actually have a big term. I think we can go, oh, we'll stay there. Um, <laughs> I'm like looking through. Um, something that I, the reason I like this picture is this is a geologic map of Yosemite of the different rocks you see as you go through. Um, when we when we talk about what is the geology of Yosemite, it's not as simple as, oh, it's all this, it's all that. Um, there's different sections. So some 
are going to be alluvial, some are going to be sedimentary, some are going to be igneous, and it's very different. So that's why I love this picture is that you can see, yes, there's big chunks of just basalt, or sorry, uh, granite, but there's also other areas where there's different types of rocks, and that's what makes this valley so unique. And you see in the middle of the valley, uh, there's a Q-A-L, and the Q means quaternary. So that is in the last 10,000 years. So that's actually, geologically speaking, very young rock, very young. It's probably sand or sedimentary rock or things like that. When we're looking around the valley, that's where the interesting geology is. That's where our granites are and all of our different quartzes and all the other intrusive geologic activity that was brought up with the uplifting that Maddie was talking about. And what we see in the valley is what's been eroded away. This is a, a picture I found of as you're flying over Yosemite, which I thought was a really different perspective than being in the valley and you feel like you're being hugged by rocks. Um, you can see in the top right middle half dome and in the bottom left middle, like right on the bottom is um, L cap. And so you can kind of see that perspective. All right, the last thing we kind of wanted to talk about is to bring this around to what can I do if I want to study glaciers and get paid for it? So this is called a glaciologist and they have really cool jobs. So what they get to do is they, well, first they study geology um, when they go to college and they probably get their master's degree in geology and they study glaciers. Um, like my friend, Allie, who is in the center picture with the blue hoodie on, she is uh, going to school right now to get her master's degree in geology, and she's focusing on glaciers. And that's a right next to it is a picture of me on a glacier, too, um, from last year. And what they do is they study output of the water that comes out of those glaciers. So there's usually streams that flow out of glaciers. So they output, they measure that, how fast it's moving, how much water there is. They measure size of glaciers and they measure where these glaciers are in comparison um, to where they were 15, 20 years ago because glaciers are getting smaller now, no matter how we see it. There, there's only a very few handful that are still getting bigger and that's because things are getting a little warmer. Um, this glacier here that you see in these pictures is a glacier in Canada. It's um, I don't remember what the name of it is, but it is in Jasper National Park in the Rocky Mountains in Canada. And this is the glacier that I got to go um, and walk over. But yeah, if you have any questions about glaciers or glaciology or the geology of Yosemite, um, go for it and ask us whatever you want to know. So yeah, if any of you have questions about Yosemite, about glaciers, um, geology in general, this is your time to ask. I found a fun fact while we were um, going through this that um, at the peak of the glaciers in Yosemite, the glaciers were 4,000 feet deep and 60 miles long. Huge glacier. How fast? So glaciers, it's very variant based on what kind of glacier it is and where it is. Um, but it can move anywhere from a few centimeters a year up to almost a foot or two every year. It's, it just depends on how much um, temperature change we have, how much the glacier grows or shrinks, um, things like that. I, I looked that up because um, that's a great question from Harley. The um, I, Jack, Jacob, Jacobsian um, glacier moves 400 meters a day. A day, wow. Sorry, I, it's Jacob Shevnan, that's the name of it, and it's 40 meters per day, and that's the fastest moving glacier. Does Yosemite have hot springs? 
Not that I'm aware of. I am either. Um, I think the difference is that, you know, Yos Yosemite is not actively volcanic. It's mm -hmm. created by volcanic activity, but um, Yellowstone is still very active. So that's probably why not. And if you look at all these, let me go back to the geologic map. Um, if you look at this, most of this stuff um, that is volcanic is almost 80 million years old. So it's pretty dang old. It was around when the dinosaurs were. So for now, for for the most part, it's cooled down. So we don't really see um, any active volcanics anymore. Ooh, that's a great question. Um, yes, they do. They so glaciers are a very complicated system, partially because we can't really track where these go. Um, but there are holes into glaciers that kind of go into nowhere, um, and they are full of water. They're full of rivers inside of them. Um, one of my favorite favorite documentaries that if you are interested in glaciers at all, please watch it. It's called Chasing Ice. It's on Netflix. It's by James Baylog, and that is. The documentary that got me into glaciers that made me realize how important they are um it's very empowering very educational highly suggest yeah these crevasses that you see in this glacier here they can be anywhere from a few feet deep to hundreds um so it's really it's really important to not go on glaciers if you're not experienced or if you don't have a guide with you because you could very easily fall into one of these and no one would probably ever find you. I saw, um, I watched a documentary last night because I was inspired by Yosemite. Um, Yosemite is also kind of the haven for mountain climbers. So um, if you're interested in mountain climbing, this is the place to go. Um, it's also, if you're into watching mountain climbing like I am, it's a place to watch documentaries. So there are two. Uh, the first is Free Solo. You probably heard about it. It's about a man who free solo climbs um, El Cap. Uh, it's amazing. It's amazing. Please watch it. And the other one is called the Dawn Wall. And it's about another climber who um, climbs El Cap for the first time in a very specific route. So both of those are documentaries that show the beauty that is Yosemite. And um, really, you learn how important the rock is and how just awesome it can be. Another fun fact about Yosemite is it's a haven for bears. Uh, they have over 300 bears in the park at any given time and up to 500 um, at the most. So it's really, it's a very hot topic to keep your food in a bear box, um, to keep bear spray with you. Because uh, it's, it's so high in altitude that the bears love the temperature up there. They love the glaciers because it gets them fresh water. And they love the trees because they can scratch their backs on them. And it's just a great place for bears to live. So if you have any more questions, please drop them into the chat. Um, we'll, we'll stick around for a couple more minutes to answer them. I did want to thank everyone who had the opportunity to be on here live with us. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. Um, if you would like to know any more about what Girl Scouts of Silver Sage is doing and what um, to look forward to, please check out our website. Erin um, just dropped it below so you can see it there. But that way you can view any upcoming lives that we're doing. We are going to continue this National Park series, so please you know, keep a lookout for more videos from us in the future. Um, and we are just so happy that you were able to be here with us today. Kristen, I saw your question come in. Yosemite was um, made a park in October of 1890. 
All right. Well, we hope everybody has a great day. Thank you.